Good morning, everyone. Um, like Steve said, we are talking about non-pharmaceutical management of chronic pain after spinal cord injury. This is a presentation that I've been able to give a couple times, um, and even a couple years ago, gave it at a conference um, with a lot of professionals that work with spinal cord injury across the U.S., um, folks ranging from therapy services to physicians, psychologists, serv uh, social workers, nurses, etc. Um, and so wanted to have a uh, a wide range of thoughts in here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the opioid epidemic. I don't know how you wouldn't be at this point uh, in the U.S. And, and we're going to touch on some of that throughout this presentation, um, as well as you know what what do you what do you have for different strategies available to individuals with spinal cord injury because it's likely that they're going to have pain after their injury. Um, so just to begin. Um, you know, I'm a little bit biased here. Um, I work in post-hospital rehab. Um, some of the things that we, we focus on in this post-hospital rehab setting at QLI are making sure that we have a high intensity of the services that we're providing, not just physical. Um, we're not just uh, in the business of uh, putting people back together physically. We're putting them back together emotionally, um, mentally, socially in a lot of ways. And uh, if any of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, gosh, you can't you can't work on getting people back to life until you're able to meet some of those physical and safety needs first, right? Um, so we want to have a high intensity of of services that we're providing from a physical standpoint, from that those basic health and wellness uh, safety um, standpoints. We need to have individualized programs for people, um, not just at QLI here, but across the board. We need to make sure that we're getting people out of the bubble of rehab and we're trying to put them into real world settings. Uh, and then ultimately from rehab to home, we need to make those transitions effective. Um, I don't care what you're doing in life, whether it's I've had a catastrophic injury or you're getting married or you're having a child or you're, you're going back to school, whatever it might be, transitions are hard. And so we have to make sure that we're helping people transition effectively. Um, our objectives for today, um, want you guys upon completion of this lecture uh, to be able to uh, differentiate between the biomedical approach and the biopsychosocial approaches in management of chronic pain. Um, upon completion of the presentation, I also want you guys to be able to identify key aspects of successful non-pharmaceutical management of chronic pain uh, of folks that have had a spinal cord injury. Um, and I also want you guys to be able to discuss how to integrate a collaborative and interdisciplinary pain management approach into the treatment of individuals with spinal cord injury as well. Um, my, my butt really from all of that is walk away with a better understanding of chronic pain with or without spinal cord injury. Um, and be ready to expand your role as a healthcare professional in helping folks that have spinal cord injury manage their pain, all right? Those are kind of my simplified objectives. What is pain? Um, you know what, I just looked this up uh, on Google this morning, right, just to see what their, their definition of pain was. And it was really short, right? It was, it was like physical, um, physical distress from injury, right? Seems really straightforward and easy, but we all know that, that pain is very, very complex, right? It's not just a tissue problem. It's not just out in the body. There are so many different things that can affect pain. Um, and so our concept of pain, uh, especially in the healthcare realm, is expanding. You know, we're trying to get away from just focusing on injury to tissue, just focusing on areas out in the body and starting to think more about what else is going on? What's going on in your life? Um, have your roles changed? Um, how are you processing some of this? What's your perception of what you're feeling? What's your educational level? Uh, what do your finances look like? What do your stress levels look like? There's so many things that flow into this. Um, in spinal cord injury specifically, you know, just doing a review of uh, 
of the literature over the years, it's really no secret that chronic pain has really waged a war on individuals that have had a spinal cord injury. Um, as I look back through some of the, the research over the years, um, there's an article by uh, Bonica back in 1991, okay? And her group reviewed uh, data in 10 different reports that surveyed close to 2,500 individuals that had, had spinal cord injury. And out of those 2,500, nearly 1,700 reported that they had chronic pain present, right? So that's 69% of those that were surveyed. And in 30% of those that said chronic pain was present, um, they rated their pain as severe. Okay, so flash forward, what, 22 years later, and there was another uh, pretty comprehensive um, report that was put out by Seidel and his group in 2009. And they reported that uh, 65 to 85% of those with spinal cord injury will experience pain. And around a third of those will have severe pain. So those reporting neuropathic pain in the subacute period at three to six months after injury are likely to continue experiencing pain at three to five years following their injury. You know, what we took from, from reviewing some of that literature was if you look at the article from 1991 and the article from 2009, those numbers really have not changed much at all, right? You're still looking at pretty much the same percentage of individuals that have chronic pain present after spinal cord injury and the same number that are reporting it as severe. So, so nothing has really changed. And we know that quality of life is greatly affected by chronic pain. If we look at some of the, the sheer numbers of, of usage for opioids throughout the world, um, this is a United Nations report from 2016. Uh, we kind of see where the U.S. compares to the rest of the world here, right? So the U.S. is in blue. The rest of the world is in yellow. We have a few different opioids down um, at the bottom on that X uh, axis, morphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, hydromorphone, fentanyl, right? And look at hydrocodone. Right? United States is consuming 99% of the hydrocodone that's been put out in the world right? 73% of the oxycodone. Um, some of this is just a mindset that we have probably in the States. Um, you know, we are looking for a quick fix. We want things fast. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I don't have to do dial up internet anymore um, and that things move really quickly. Um, if I want to know something, I can know it pretty fast, right? And I get frustrated if my Wi-Fi is not connecting well and it's it's loading really slow, right? We want a quick fix. We want things to happen fast. Uh, and so it, it would make sense that we have this mentality um, that we want a quick fix. And um, opioids have been tapped in the past as kind of that, that quick fix in a lot of ways. It's, it's going to kind of cover things up. But it's also gotten us into a, a pretty bad state. If you look historically at opioid use in the U.S., uh, you know, you look back into the, the early 1900s and you could easily uh, get cocaine just over the counter in your, your local store, right? Um, it, it wasn't frowned upon necessarily. Uh, over the years, uh, it became a substance that uh, was more restricted, obviously. So you get into the mid, um, mid 1900s and uh, it became a substance that was more regulated at that time. And then at some point in in the 1980s or so, that thought changed again. Late 70s, early 80s, that thought changed. And we started to see more prescribing of um, of these medications again. Here the pendulums swung again over, over uh, to the other side in the last several years where we're saying, you know what, we've been using this for 30 years. We've been prescribing it for 30 years. And it's really not doing the trick. Um, People are reporting the same amounts of pain um, after spinal cord injury if they're taking some of these opioids. Um, and it's also putting them at risk of addiction and uh, suicide rates have certainly increased with uh, opioid use as well. All right, um, CDC guidelines from 2016 are recommending dosages of 50 uh, to less than 100 morphine milligram equivalents, um, increased risk for opioid overdose by factors of 1.9 to 4.6. Uh, dosages of 100 morphine milligram equivalents or more increases the risk for opioid overdose by factors of 2 to 8.9%. Um, opioid poisoning. Drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S. right now. 
Uh, in 2014, opioids were involved in 61% of all drug overdose deaths. And in 2014, overdose rates were highest among people aged 25 to 54. Um, so we have a problem, right? Chronic pain and opioid use in individuals with spinal cord injury. Um, I want to talk about how can we expand the roles of the rehab teams early on, you know, especially within the first year of injury, to build a solid foundation of knowledge for people with spinal cord injury and ultimately change how chronic pain is managed. Who, who should be addressing this and when do we address it? All right, so there's a couple different approaches that we've taken. There's biomedical and biopsychosocial, right? Those are a couple things that I, I just talked about in the objectives earlier. Biomedical, um, again, it's, it's a lot more heavily focused on the tissue. Something is wrong with your body and we're just gonna focus on that component, right? It's not always wrong, but it's, it's one piece of the puzzle. Um, so this is usually medical or interventional and it's modality centered. So there's surgical approaches here, right? Um, there's a lot of pharmaceutical management involved in this. There's nerve blocks, injections, neurostimulation, um, heavy reliance on findings from imaging studies, right? Um, again, a big focus on what's going on with the tissues, what's the underlying mechanism. Um, and ultimately, this is more of a passive approach, right? If I'm an individual that has a spinal cord injury and I'm having chronic pain, I am relying on other people to basically just figure this out for me and do something about it. Um, again, it's, it's not always wrong, but it's one piece of the puzzle. And this just tends to uh, lean more toward being passive for the individual that's having the chronic pain. Um, if we look at some research, um, this one is by Benzmail um, and his colleagues. Uh, there's a low level of proof in the studies found in the literature um, that does not allow for the recommending the use of drugs such as clonidine, morphine, lidocaine, or bacofin in daily practice to treat the neuropathic pain of SCI patients. Uh, there's potential positive impact of intrathecal baclofen for neuropathic pain management in some patients. So again, we're just looking at some, some medications, right, pharmaceutical approach, um, and we're seeing that uh, there's, there's not a high level of proof that those things are working to manage the neuropathic pain um, for SCI folks. Just um, from a, a practice standpoint, individuals that I've worked with over the years, you know, a number of them will start off on, on high levels of um, gabapentin, maybe even Lyrica, uh, to manage some of their uh, neuropathic pain, uh, this chronic neuropathic pain that's occurring after their spinal cord injury. And over time, many of them ultimately just get off of some of those medications because they just don't like either how it's making them feel or they're recognizing that it's not doing much uh, for them at all. From a biopsychosocial standpoint, uh, we'll look at a couple different definitions here. Um, but the overarching theme is that this is going to be a little bit more uh, of an active involvement from the individual that's having the chronic pain. Uh, so we look at Feinberg and his colleagues in 2013. Uh, they define the biopsychosocial model as an illness and disability as a result of and influences uh, diverse areas of an individual's life, including the biological, psychological, social, environmental, and cultural components of their existence. Um, Roth and his group um, go a step further and they say that integrated and multidisciplinary programs for chronic pain have been consistently supported by research as superior to less comprehensive modalities and procedure focused interventional pain medicine, right? So that's kind of comparing the biopsychosocial model to the biomedical and saying, listen, if you're using more of a group approach and integrated multidisciplinary program to help with chronic pain for these individuals, it's far superior um, to less comprehensive models, right, where you're just looking at an intervention or a biomedical approach. Feinberg, um, again, says a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach to pain management that is individualized, functionally oriented, not pain oriented, and goal specific has been found to be the most effective treatment approach. So again, um, his research is supporting that of Ross as well, that uh, you got to make this um, this rehab approach, multidisciplinary, it's got to come from lots of different angles, it's got to be individualized, and it's got to be goal-specific and functionally oriented, not focused on the tissue, not focused on just the pain. Um, what does this lead to? This, this leads to more of an active approach from the individual that has the chronic pain. Um, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, rather than this, this paternalistic model where someone is, is telling you what needs to happen and what's wrong with you, you're part of the team, 
there's a collaborative effort. While you may not bring um, medical information to the table, you bring knowledge of yourself and you have some control and some power as part of that team, right? And the goal is for the, the individuals to accept responsibility to ultimately manage their pain and acquire effective coping strategies in the long term. Um, so I'm gonna shift here into what are some of these key aspects of managing chronic pain? Um, you know, we, we actually just did a journal club uh, here recently uh, with our therapists and some others at QLI, and we, we talked about some of these same steps, right? So uh, one, we have to identify that it's a problem. Two, we have to identify that uh, what the source of pain is. Um, we need to educate people well, right? Pain, after, especially after spinal cord injury, um, it, it can be kind of uh, mystical. You don't know what's happening. You don't know why it's happening. You don't understand your body all that well. And we have to demystify that in a lot of ways, which is going to come through education, not just for the individual, but for their support system as well. And then ultimately, we have to implement a good plan as a team uh, to help them uh, develop some good coping strategies uh, moving forward. So uh, from an identifying it's a problem standpoint, you know, if, if we look at our healthcare providers um, and think about who's going to be spending the most time with the individual, it really changes, you know, over that first year, right? So from the time that the individual has the injury, has a spinal cord injury, to a year later, you know, most of the time beginning, right, they're going to be in the ICU potentially, and a year later they're at home. So the amount of support and the people around them over the course of that time is going to change. Early on, this is kind of what it's going to look like, right? So you have that individual kind of in the center, and then look at all of these different disciplines that are there, that are involved. Um, and I tried to intentionally create a lot of overlap in those bubbles. There should not be silos with all of these different disciplines. Again, we need to have a collaborative effort, and everyone needs to be able to identify, hey, we have, a, we have a, a pain issue going on, and this isn't just uh, the physician's problem. This isn't just PT's problem. This isn't just nursing's problem. But how do we look at this together and create a plan for them from the get-go? I think too many times, um, and this has been reported in the research too, there are many states that have come out with, with guidelines and prescription of opioids now as well. Um, but too many times we're creating a dependence early on. We're creating a mindset of helplessness and, and even a habit of I need to take X medication in order to fix my problem. It's appropriate early on when maybe we have some orthopedic issues. We just had uh, organized trauma right when we went in for a surgery to maybe correct some of the things that happened to the spine itself um, and so we had to go in we had to do a surgery we cut through tissues we repaired bones perhaps we put in some hardware um, and so there's going to be some orthopedic um, related pain that some of those op opioid medications might be helpful for in terms of breakthrough pain early on um, but there needs to be um, some confined uh, uh, time frames as to how long we're going to take some of those opioids and then what our strategies are going to be to get off of those and to move forward for pain uh, pain management. Uh, this is a time to do it early on in rehabilitation. Uh, find some good coping mechanisms and some good pain management strategies as a team because as time progresses, this is what that support looks like, right? You have the individual, they might be at home, they might have outpatient services, so they have a touch point with maybe physical therapy, occupational therapy services. They're occasionally perhaps seeing their primary care provider or a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. Um, and otherwise, it's, it's them and their support system, right? So we need to do a good job early on of identifying the problem, of where it's coming from, and moving forward with that. Um, Bryce in 2012 came out with um, this model to identify pain after spinal cord injury uh, and to kind of use it as an algorithm to think through how do we best treat this type of pain moving forward, right? Um, and this has been adopted um, and is, is, been, is, is being used by um, physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians that specialize in spinal cord injury and should be used um, 
uh, kind of across the board for folks that uh, that are specializing in spinal cord injury. Uh, so we have a few different pain types. You have nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, other pain, and unknown pain. I'm going to focus a lot of my efforts on nociceptive and neuropathic pain, right? Because if we, can, if we can identify where it's coming from, then we can also educate and we can address it um, with the appropriate intervention strategies too. So within nociceptive pain, right, we have a few subtypes. We have musculoskeletal, we have visceral, right, organ types of pain, and we have some other types in there. Musculoskeletal pain is, it's fairly straightforward, right? So if we have, uh, if we have an area that maybe we have normal sensation above the level of injury in spinal cord injury, um, if an individual is having pain in a joint um, or they're having muscular pain, um, we can think through, you know, is there anything that's changed recently? Um, have you been trying a new activity? Um, did you have a mechanism that would have led to maybe a fracture of some kind or, or a tear in a tendon or muscle tissue? Um, and we can address that um, appropriately, right? That's not going to require um, opioids. That, you know, is going to be looking at, we have an inflammatory process that's happening. Um, how do we reduce the inflammation in the area? How do we reduce the pain? What types of modalities can we use? How do we educate on something like that? Uh, visceral pain, right, could be coming from heart. Um, abdominal pain maybe due to bowel impaction. Um, perhaps they have um, other issues with bowels or urinary system, maybe a kidney stone, and we have to be able to identify those appropriately. Um, other nociceptive pain that can happen it could be related to cuts or surgical incisions, right? Headaches, um, things of that nature. Neuropathic pain, right? There's a difference between nociceptive and neuropathic pain. Your neuropathic pain is oftentimes going to be, uh, within a spinal cord injury, going to be at the level of the spinal cord injury or below the level of the spinal cord injury. Um, and again, knowing what it is is going to change how we educate down the line too. If it's at the level of spinal cord injury, uh, we need to think through how far post are they from their injury. Um, maybe we need to start thinking about are we getting some compression of the spinal cord injury? Are we having some nerve root compression? Is there kind of equina compression? Again, that's not early on, but generally that's as tissues mature. Um, if all of a sudden we're getting this flaring of pain at the level of the spinal cord injury, um, those are some things that need to start going through our heads. Uh, below the level of spinal cord injury, um, oftentimes you're seeing uh, kind of that shooting, stabbing, burning type of pain. Um, it, it could be something as severe as spinal cord ischemia or spinal cord compression, but a lot of the time uh, it's just one of those things that, that comes and is present after the spinal cord injury. Um, other neuropathic pain that could happen um, is not necessarily going to be below the level of the injury, but it could be say you have a user of a manual wheelchair that's pushing around a lot, they're using their arms for a lot of transfers, and they're starting to get some numbness and tingling in their hands, right? Well, they're using their arms, they're using their hands and their wrists a lot, putting them in positions that uh, are compressing the carpal tunnel. You could be getting some neuropathic types of pain in the hand and fingers and wrist because we're compressing the carpal tunnel in that, in that standpoint. If you have an individual that's diabetic, um, again, and you're looking at an area of normal sensation, you could think that maybe it's a diabetic polyneuropathy that's happening. Uh, a couple other types of pain that uh, could exist would be related to fibromyalgia, uh, CRPS, um, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, a lot of the times what we're working with in our setting is differentiating between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. All right, so from an education standpoint, right, we said we have to um, identify that they have pain, we have to identify the source, right, and now we need to educate. So uh, one, we need to kind of develop a framework for understanding. Uh, again, a lot of folks' pain comes back to that, that definition that I found on Google this morning, right? It's just kind of short and sweet. I, I have pain and I understand it as pain, but there's a lot that goes into that and we have to help people understand that. Um, we also have to understand that, uh, you know, when people are in crisis, uh, when they're having a lot of stress, they're learning a lot of things, they're 
their roles in life have been flipped upside down in a lot of ways, uh, that's going to affect their ability to learn. So how we educate, um, how often we're educating, um, identifying how they best learn are some things that we need to consider when we are uh, providing education. And then I think it's always important, especially in a collaborative model, to know who has the relationship, who's the right who, who does this person respect, who are they going to listen to, um, who's influential in the support system, um, identifying them and making sure that we're able to, again, educate appropriately. So something we've been focusing a little bit more on in our setting, um, and me personally have been trying to learn about, is th therapeutic neuroscience education. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it's any surprise, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, just with a mindset in the U.S. of wanting a quick fix, that some of the guys that are doing some great research on pain science, um, pain neuroscience um, specifically, uh, are not natives of the U.S. Uh, Adrian Lau is a, a physical therapist that's doing a lot of um, research and intervention on uh, pain neuroscience, uh, and he's from South Africa originally. There are a couple guys out of Australia that are doing a lot uh, with this as well. And so, you know, a little bit different mindset. Um, they're going to attack pain a little bit differently than, than we might, just culturally as well. Uh, but TNE and uh, kind of focuses on this educational model where we, we help people understand that pain ultimately is it's, it's a normal human experience, all right? And without the ability to experience pain, uh, humans over time wouldn't survive, right? But living in pain isn't normal. So a big reason, and I've hit on this several times, but they say a big reason that pain, re pain rates are increasing is that we've put too much focus on tissues, right? So muscles, ligaments, joints, bones, um, and a lot of that stuff we know is healed within three and six months, right? So those tissues are going to heal um, within that time frame. And then you have, uh, especially after spinal cord injury, you have this this chronic pain that's kind of hanging around. We need to look uh, at how they're perceiving their pain, how they're thinking about their pain, right? Persistent pain is more due to a sensitive nervous system and how the brain is processing information from the body and the environment. A great example of this is just coming back to maybe identifying, again, is it nociceptive or is it neuropathic? And in spinal cord injury, is that above the level of injury or is it below their level of injury? You know, above the level of injury, an individual oftentimes they're gonna be able to tell you exactly where that pain is and maybe something that they did recently that would have caused the pain to spike a little bit more. Below their level of injury, that pain is gonna be more persistent. It's gonna be shooting, it's gonna be burning. Uh, it can feel sometimes like a python is wrapping up a, a leg or an ankle or a foot or like they have a compression. Um, bandage around it. It's just kind of uh, tightening it up all the time, right? Well, if we've had if we've had damage to the spinal cord, and that pain is originating, and they're feeling it down in their foot, uh, it's almost like you know listening to a radio station that isn't coming in clearly, right? It's really fuzzy, but you can hear a little bit of what the broadcaster is saying in the background. So you still have intact nervous system down in the foot. Those nerves are still there. They can get input, but getting the information up to the brain is going to be disrupted because you've had an injury to some of those, those super highways that are carrying the information up to the brain. So the sensation they're getting down in the foot is being interpreted by the brain, but there's something in the middle that's blocking correct interpretation. Um, so just in terms of helping to educate folks, we need them to understand that, hey, your pain system's there, it's good, it's meant to be an alarm system for you, and let's look at this normal excitation level of the nervous system, and that firing level is where we get pain, right, where we interpret pain. So normal tissue injury, foot steps on the nail, the alarm's gonna activate, you're gonna see um, that spike up, to a message firing level where it sends a message to your brain that says, hey, you just did something bad, you better pull your foot off of that thing, right? Um, and you you know what's causing pain. Uh, in, in the case of a spinal cord injury, something that's small can turn into something big, right? Uh, uh, the illustration that's, uh, that's used here is an ankle sprain shouldn't feel like a bus hit you, right? Um, so again, a lot of this is, is work with 
uh, with the brain. It's it's thinking about and understanding what's happening out in the body. Um, so uh, coming back to that idea that we talked about earlier, that pain is more complex than just a one sentence statement. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, I'm still holding on to uh, the kind of the alarm. So I'm, I'm still thinking about where that alarm is going to go off at right now, right? Uh, but pain is complex. It's like this this lion that can be created from lots of different explanations of what's going on in your body, to money concerns, to job issues, to relational fears, um, constant stresses, failed treatments over time, anxiety. All of those things are going to flow into it. And yes, there could be something with the tissues that's going on as well. Um, what we need people to get to um, ultimately is bringing down the threshold to where their alarm system is going off. Um, before they had pain, they had lots of room for activities, right? Um, after they have pain, they have little room for activities. So that threshold, they're extra sensitive, the threshold has come up and they're firing a lot easier. The alarm system is going off a lot easier. We wanna bring that extra sensitive line back down as close to the normal excited level as we possibly can. And a lot of that, I would argue, is going to come through education. It's going to help them understand that, hey, listen, your foot might be screaming at you right now because it's burning, but do you actually have something going on out there? Right? Do you actually have something stabbing into your foot? Um, no. So you can look at it, you can see it, and you can start to reshape how you're interpreting what's happening out in your body. Right? We may not necessarily have an explanation for why it's feeling like that other than, listen, you're getting signals, they're coming to your spinal cord, but those signals are being blocked and your brain isn't able to interpret them correctly. And so you're interpreting it as pain based off of previous experiences, based off of what you know. Um, you know, you can, you, can put, um, you can put two people up next to each other that have the same experience and they may have, um, sorry, the same pain, pain uh, cause but they may have different pain experiences right um, there's stories all over the place uh, of women that you know give birth and uh, one person it's excruciating and the next person uh, it's it's really easy and they like doing it right um, why are those people different why do they have different experiences um, our bodies are relatively formatted in the same way but our our brains, based on the experiences that we have and how we interpret things, um, can vary drastically, right? That takes us into kind of an implementing the plan uh, part of this presentation. So again, from a passive standpoint uh, and an active standpoint, there are different things that we can do. And, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit differently from the, the passive and active approaches that we talked about earlier. Right, we said the biomedical approach was a little more passive. You're relying on someone to do something for you, versus a biopsychosocial approach is more active. You're an engaged person as part of the team in that approach. Um, in this part of it, uh, passive and active are, are related to non-pharmaceutical um, interventions for managing or coping with the pain. So, passively, things that they could do: uh, massage, ice, heat. Um, osteopathy, dry needling, acupuncture, um, transcranial electrical stimulation um, for post spinal cord injury pain. Um, there's transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, post spinal cord injury pain. Even transcranial magnetic stimulation have been um, more passive modalities that have been shown to help with chronic neuropathic pain. Actively, again, coming back to education. Knowledge is power, right? So we want to empower people and help them understand what's going on with their bodies. And they need to know that for pain, but they also need to know that for how their bowel or bladder is working after spinal cord injury. Um, they need to know about autonomic dysreflexia, all of those things. So it's just another part of the puzzle for them to understand about their body after their spinal cord injury. Exercise, aerobic exercise has been shown um, to help with chronic pain, right? Um, increasing blood flow to muscles that aren't getting blood flow essentially uh, exercises for post spinal cord injury pain exercises for shoulder pain um, and behavioral management of pain post spinal cord injury thinking about diet thinking about sleep hygiene 
and also giving people vision, so goal mapping, not feeling like they're stuck in this place, but helping them understand, you know, what are, where are places that I can go in life, what are things that I can look forward to, and helping to break that down into smaller components for them. Um, there was a, a great article put out by uh, Penelope Hamwood and her group, um, several nurses that have worked with spinal cord injury for a while, but it was just a qualitative uh, analysis of individuals that um, had pain experiences after spinal cord injury. It was kind of this process of acceptance that they went through, and they, they ultimately came up with this model that you're seeing in front of you that's, that starts with uh, kind of defining pain and ends with integrating pain. So early on, a lot of these individ individuals would kind of, uh, they define their pain, you know, more metaphorically, like my, my pain feels like a python is wrapping up my, my feet, right? Or my pain feels like um, a car is running over my foot. It's more crushing. So it was more metaphorical rather than just these sharp shooting, burning, stabbing types of definitions that we'll use sometimes. Um, and, and early on after their injuries, they would seek uh, resolution. They wanted the quick fix, right? So it was all about medication. But there's a process that they went through to ultimately acknowledge that maybe this isn't going away. And they had, had to start redefining what some of their core values were, right? So who, who am I? Who do I want to be? Am I going to let pain define what I'm able to do or not able to do? Am I going to let it limit my activity? Um, and there's a process then of learning to live with pain and ultimately integrating pain into their life. So understanding that, you know, it's there, but I'm not going to let it control me. I'm going to control it, right? And there's, there's a shift. We've kind of gone through this through the presentation too. There's a shift from I have pain and I want it to go away to I have pain, but I can control it and I'm not going to let it control me. Um, it's a lot harder than just this circle that's here. And it takes a lot of people um, involved in a collaborative process and a lot of resiliency from the individual that's having the pain as well. Um, but again, this is, a, this is a huge process to go through. And ultimately, um, they have to get to that point where they're able to integrate it into their life and not allow it to control them. But what you see then is this uh, evolving view of their pain that leads to an increase in their independence and the amount of control that they have on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so staying along those lines of just integration, right, integrating um, some of the pain management strategies into their lives so that they can they can live more independently. Again, we're looking at an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, having a positive and supportive environment um, from a, a psychological standpoint, um, utilizing uh, strategies like cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, and then having different pain management strategies. Um, so again, coming back to that Hugh Tink article that uh, we discussed a little bit earlier, um, they also outline in there that a multidisciplinary cognitive behavioral program might have beneficial effects on people with chronic neuropathic spinal cord injury pain. Um, you think about that, that circle, that cycle that we just went through, um, this is kind of reshaping or redefining some of those core values, right? Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is looking at what are those core values, what are some of those core beliefs, and if they're a little skewed, right, how do you change those? Um, and then the Houston article, um, they saw a significant decrease in pain intensity and pain-related disability um, and significant treatment effects for anxiety and participation in activities. Roth, uh, again, we mentioned a couple of these articles earlier, um, but we're going a little bit more in depth into them. Roth noted integrated and multidisciplinary programs for chronic pain have been consistently supported by research as superior to less comprehensive modalities of procedure-focused interventional pain medicine. And again, Feinberg, again, is just saying that comprehensive multidisciplinary approach to pain management um, is the key, right, to getting functionally oriented and goal-specific um, outcomes. So again, have that positive, supportive environment for the individual. The inpatient setting, uh, should be indicated for individuals who do not have minimal functional capacity to participate effectively in an outpatient program. Uh, they need uh, or they have medical conditions that require more intensive oversight 
maybe they're receiving large amounts of medications necessitating uh, medication weaning or detoxification, and they probably have complex medical or psychosocial diagnoses that would benefit from a more intensive observation um, or additional consultation during that rehab process. Uh, so again, pain is complex. Uh, some of the lists that we see from folks coming in, they can have four or five pages of meds on those lists, and we're trying to help wean them off of some of those medications. Um, ultimately, if you're working in this interdisciplinary setting, it's all about building trust and rapport with the individual. You know, if we can start with the relationship and having rapport with them and they trust us, we can move forward. In our program, uh, before anyone comes to us, uh, one, they have to agree to coming into our program, but two, we're starting that relationship building process via the phone, FaceTime, contacts, uh, long before they even come to us. That way they know some of the faces and the people that are going to be pushing them fairly hard when they do get into our program. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, again, we're looking at the cycle of pain, right? You may have increased pain and distress, leads to pain catastrophizing, fear of activity, avoidance, deconditioning, and it just kind of goes in this cycle over and over and over. We want to break that cycle um, from a psychological standpoint using cognitive behavioral therapy. And I would venture to, to argue that we don't just have to leave this up to our psychologists, uh, our therapists and anyone that's that's working in an interdisciplinary program needs to be skilled in using CBT with individuals um, just in conversation. That's I think it's part of the relationship building and being able to kind of push back and press in on, on some of the maybe irrational thoughts um, that, that are in um, some of maybe their core beliefs or core values, right? Uh, Craner had an article in 2016 that noted a significant relationship between pain catastrophizing and other factors adversely related to functioning with chronic pain, including greater depressed mood, decreased mental and physical health related quality of life, and higher pain severity and life interference. Um, and also that participation in a comprehensive rehab program resulted in significant decreases in pain catastrophizing and that this decrease was a significant partial mediator of the corresponding improvement in treatment outcomes upon program completion. In other words, um, the pain interference and depressed mood uh, were, were able to be brought down or decreased uh, because we're kind of attacking uh, the pain catastrophizing with CBT. A um, few other articles, again, just supporting the use of, of cognitive behavioral therapy um, within multidisciplinary programs uh, for, for addressing chronic pain. Um, a few other resources for you guys on these slides, too. Uh, we, we like to use uh, cognitive behavioral therapy a lot, um, but uh, ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, um, Progressive Goal Attainment Program, another resource called Take Courage Coaching, um, are all some resources for you guys to be able to take away on here too. Uh, you know, and a lot of times we hear about alternative pain management strategies. Um, I want to cross out the alternative aspect of this and just think of them as pain management strategies. They don't have to fall in the alternative category. Uh, there's a lot of great evidence on yoga and Tai Chi and aquatic therapy uh, to manage pain nowadays. Modalities, massage therapy, different positioning techniques in bed or in wheelchair, uh, regular range of motion and stretching can help reduce pain over time, um, bringing in mindfulness strategies, helping people um, just slow down and focus a little bit more, not be, uh, not just focus on their pain all of the time, uh, stress management strategies, coping strategies that you can work with, uh, with counselors or psychologists. Uh, nutrition education, right? What you put into your body, what you fuel your body with is going to impact how you feel. Um, sleep hygiene, what you do before bed, how you go to sleep, um, how often you're sleeping is going to impact mood. It's going to impact activity during the day, uh, which can also impact how you feel from a pain standpoint. Um, and then participating in functional activities uh, can all be uh, pain management strategies that can be go-to or places to start uh, from a pain management standpoint. Um, I have a few more minutes here. Uh, I did want to go through kind of a short case example with you guys uh, with an individual 
that we had a few years back uh, that went through a pretty large taper um, after his spinal cord injury. So this is a gentleman that was injured um, in March of 2015. He had a C5 incomplete Asia C injury. And so just kind of define that real quick. C5 obviously is going to be up in the neck. And then the incomplete Asia C component is basically saying that, you know, we're getting some information through that level of injury. Uh, and the, the Asia C part means that we're actually getting sensation and we're getting some movement through that level of injury, but not enough movement to really stand and walk and, and, and move in those regards, right? It might be some movement in the feet or a little bit of movement in the, the arms or trunk, but not enough to really push yourself up against gravity. Um, QLI for him happened to be his seventh location on his rehab journey. Uh, he was six months post injury and he stayed with us um, for about 12 weeks, so a three month stay. Uh, over the course of those seven months, he was in, in and out of uh, acute rehab hospital. He ended up in long term care for a little bit before he uh, ultimately got to us. Uh, our focus uh, for him was helping him to stay healthy and just refining some of his basic health needs, right? We wanted to look at just functional and applied movement with him and then getting back to life in general. Some other things that we had to consider uh, was his history of drug and alcohol abuse, his history of requesting and getting more opioids. So over those, um, those six months before he came to us, uh, he kept having more and more pain and he kept... Um, he kept getting more and more medications. You can imagine as he's jumping around to different places, uh, he's requesting this stuff and it just kept getting layered on. So he admitted with um, 360 morphine milligram equivalents, which if you remember a couple of those first slides that we looked at, that's really high. You know, over 100 morphine milligram equivalents um, led to up to a 9% increase in overdose. Um, so even that, that raised a red flag from the get-go that, hey, this is one of those things that we've got to address from the get-go with him. So again, coming back to, to uh, what we talked about in the middle of this presentation, we were responsible as a team to identify that this was a problem, right? It was a red flag, but we needed to identify what the source of pain was for him, and we needed to educate him and his support system and then implement a plan for him to be successful. Um, so... Over the course of his stay, we, we obviously had to build a little bit of a relationship with him um, and got to know him a little bit. He had some success with his physical rehabilitation. Uh, I ended up kind of being that person that had some credibility with him to come in and say, hey, listen, I really think that the amount of, of opioids that you're taking is impacting some of your physical progress right now. Um, if we look at how much you're taking, it really doesn't seem to be helping your pain. And honestly, if we get off of some of that, I think we'll be able to perhaps feel a little bit better, be more alert throughout the day, and be more engaged in your therapy uh, to make more progress that you want to make from a physical aspect. Um, and we started in on, on the education part with he and his dad, uh, just in regards to what he was feeling and where some of that was coming from. We started incorporating some, some adapted yoga, massage on a regular basis, uh, a lot of stretching for him, um, educated his dad on stretching techniques uh, so that he could help him on a regular basis, and even some positioning things that he could do in his wheelchair to stretch out and get out of a seated position throughout his day. Um, educating on the difference between where he was having muscle soreness, so that nociceptive pain versus neuropathic types of pain, the burning, shooting pain in his legs was also key for him. Um, and over those three months that he was with us, he was able to get off of all of those opioids and he was managing a lot of his pain um, with uh, modalities like heat, stretching, massage, yoga. Uh, we had taken a really deep dive into what his sleep hygiene looked like, the surface that he was sleeping on, uh, how we could find something that would turn him throughout the night so that he wasn't getting woken up every two to three hours and getting his sleep disrupted. Uh, and then even looking at, um, you know, utilizing a Foley catheter or a condom catheter overnight so that uh, he wouldn't have to wake up to intermittent cath overnight as well. Uh, and incorporating all of those things helped to get off of the pain medications. And then we were able to implement, implement uh, modalities and techniques for him to take 
forward with him when he went home. Um, he's made a lot of progress even since that time to the point where he's able to do some standing and walking on his own. Uh, but again, before he came to us, he hadn't been able to participate in a lot of active rehabilitation. He had a lot of pain and it took kind of an integrated collaborative approach to get him away from some of that. Uh, the genius Albert Einstein once said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know, come back to one of those beginning slides that we looked at and the research from 1991 to 2009 just showed that we were doing the same thing over and over again, um, kind of slapping on opioids, but nothing was really changing, right? Um, and so we need to we need to reshape and we need to think uh, differently about how we're addressing pain. We need to be collaborative. We need to get people in collaborative environments um, to make sure that they're getting input and thoughts from lots of different disciplines um, and not just doing the same thing over and over and expecting that we're going to get um, different results. So in conclusion, uh, again, we need to shift our mindset away from this tertiary model, this biomedical model, um, and just defaulting to medication and injections. Um, certainly some medications can be helpful uh, in, in specific situations for specific individuals. Um, but then big picture, we all need to take a greater responsibility in educating and understanding pain and educating individuals with spinal cord injury, their support systems, and one another. <clears throat> There's a long list of references if you guys um, find a lot of joy in scrolling through uh, research articles at the end of these presentations too. All right, and that's all I have for you today.